Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my inmost being. Praise His name, praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all His benefits, O oh my soul. Be forgiven. Oh, oh.
morning. My name is Jim Bishop. At this time, I'll lead our thoughts in communion. Uh, so communion is a time when we can reflect on uh, just the impact that Jesus has on our life and kind of reflect that, slow down the week's activity. And of course, in this time, it's a lot tougher to really stay connected and really have uh, meaningful conversations as we're isolating and, and not being connected as much as we are. Now, actually, for me, that's probably not that big of challenge just because I'm naturally a, an introvert and uh, growing up from a, in a family of 10 kids, I was always looking for alone time anyway. But uh, that, has a, that has an end. And um, what we're hearing in the news and, and maybe with some conversations is loneliness and being separated has really become a problem. It's actually kind of becoming an epidemic in our society. About a third of the people uh, report being lonely in some way. Uh, and it's kind of woven into our society and just how we interact with each other. So, for instance, if you're uh, asking somebody, you know, walk up on the street and how are you doing? And, you know, some acceptable responses are I'm happy or I'm tired or I'm frustrated, having a bad day. But if someone were to just say, I'm feeling lonely today, that would be very abnormal and, and awkward. Um, social media actually is not a help at all. Uh, we're finding out uh, this being a passive uh, participant in social media actually increases our loneliness. But Jesus has an answer. So if we turn to uh, John chapter 14, in verse 16, uh, I'll read there in a second. Um, so just a little context, this is a conversation between Jesus and his apostles, and he's getting ready to uh, to go to his crucifixion. And he's talking about leaving, and uh, his apostles are talk asking, you know, show us God. And and he, of course, famously says, you know, if don't you know me? And if you know me, you know God up, up above that. So that's kind of the context of these verses. But in uh, 
We'll pick up in verse uh, 16, uh, John 14 and verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and will be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So Jesus is making a, a great promise there that he's not going to leave us alone. We're not going to be orphans. We're not going to be disconnected. He is not a God that uh, doesn't uh, interact with us. And God is with us now, and he's with you in this time. And to me, that's probably one of the main purposes Jesus really wants us to, to take this time each week to connect with each other, but also to connect uh, with him. And so we are not alone. It's a great promise. Right at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, uh, in verse 3, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. The lonely, the, the disconnected, your home is here. And Jesus uh, paved the way for us to be connected and to always have that as, as our rich inheritance. So as we um, say a prayer in just a moment, I would say let's um, think about our connection with God and how he doesn't leave us alone, even in the midst of maybe feeling that way, uh, that we're not alone. And then uh, maybe reach out to someone today or this week and commune with them. Tell them the impact of Jesus had on your in your life and is having in your life. So let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, your generous gift of being uh, adopted into your family, that we are not alone, we are not orphans, that we will always be uh, have a home with you and be connected. Thank you for paying the price, the fact that we can be uh, uh, we can be full family members and we're not uh, a servant, we're not uh, an outcast, but we, we belong uh, in your family. I pray that uh, we can really connect with that this morning and we can uh, share that blessing with those around us. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen.
He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us all and oh how he loves us how he loves us Good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be speaking to the great Minneapolis St. Paul Church of Christ. I have such fond memories of speaking there at a men's forum many, many years ago. And while I wish I could be there in person, I'm still glad for this opportunity to be with you virtually. My wife, Barry, and I have many great friends in the church there, some that go way, way back. So shout out to all of them. And of course, we love and respect the Cheryls 
and the Burns so much as well. You guys are really blessed with such amazing leaders and servants and members in the church there. The whole church here in Des Moines sends their love to you also. We really value our partnership in the upper Midwest along with you guys. A while back, I was digging into the Gospels to study about how Jesus taught and trained others. And I noticed how Jesus loved to ask questions. So then I started studying out all the questions that Jesus asked to the people around him. That was such a cool study, and I liked it so much that I turned it into a series of sermons. And right now in Des Moines, I'm preaching that very series. It's really an eye-opening study because we can learn a lot about Jesus by seeing what questions he asked. We see what really mattered to him. Then we also learn a lot about ourselves as we wrestle with how we would answer those questions that Jesus asked. See, some of the questions he asked were inspiring and endearing. Questions like, are you not much more valuable than they? Ooh, that's a good one. Or, what do you want me to do for you? Man, that's a great question. But some of the other questions are really pointed and penetrating. Like, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Or, do you truly love me more than these? Ooh, those are good questions. So today, I want to share one of those sermons with you one of the questions. I want to focus on a single question of Jesus that's one of my favorites. It's unique, and it's both the inspiring kind and the penetrating kind at the same time. It's one that cuts straight to the heart of where we live and breathe on a daily basis. So as Jesus looks deeply into our hearts and souls with his eyes like blazing fire and that omniscient knowledge of even what's done in secret, this might be a question that he would ask each of us today. We find it in John chapter 5, verse 1 through 9. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water's stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. Okay, this is a really good story. I love this story. No matter how many times you read it, it's still an inspiring story. But he asks this pointed, inspiring question. Do you want to get well? See, what was going on there is there's this pool. And it was believed that the pool had some special powers. That every once in a while, an angel would come down and stir the waters. And those who went into the pool right after the waters were stirred would be healed of their ailments. While Jesus walked up the pool, he sees this guy who'd been an invalid for 38 years. Now, we're not sure how he got that way. Perhaps he had some accident or sickness, or maybe he was born that way. But somehow, he'd heard about this miraculous pool and must have been excited to finally find hope and a cure. Somehow he got there. But then, over time, his hopes kept getting dashed because someone would cut in front of him and they would get the healing before him. And you get the feel that this has been going on for a long time. And I think about it, I get frustrated when somebody cuts me off in traffic, okay? How much more this guy when somebody's always cutting him off from getting that healing and he's left there remaining as an invalid? I can imagine what he must have been feeling. So discouraged, hopeless, bitter, kind of cynical. Then Jesus walks up and stands before him. And I picture Jesus just kind of being silhouetted. You know, the sun setting and it's right behind his head and he blocks the sun with his head and, and the guy looks up at Jesus and Jesus looks straight at him with that love and with that passion and asks him this question. And what a powerful, poignant question it was. It cut straight to the heart and hit him right where he was living. Do you want to get well? Well, when you think about this question, 
I think there's really two dimensions to it. First, I think Jesus is asking, do you know who I am and what I'm capable of? Do you know who's standing before you? Okay, it kind of reminds me of this TV show. I don't know if this TV show is still on anymore, but I used to watch it a while back. It's called Undercover Boss. Okay, have you guys ever seen that? Undercover Boss. In the show, a CEO of some big company like Walmart or something dresses up like a normal worker dude and starts working a pretty lowly job in his company. He talks with the workers, gets to know them, and sees what's really going on deep within the culture and practices of his company. And typically, the CEO will really get close to some kind-hearted, hard-working employee and, and just get to know that person, get to know their life and their family and their dreams. And then a while afterwards, after he leaves that position, the CEO calls that person into their office and reveals who he really is. And the people are always blown away. Then he gives that person some huge gift to help them fulfill their dreams that they had shared with him. But the whole time the CEO was working alongside that person, he had to be thinking exactly what Jesus was thinking here. Do you know who I am? Do you know what I'm capable of? Do you know who's working alongside of you? It's funny. So in that respect, Jesus was the first undercover boss, if you will. Well, when Jesus sees this man's condition, this invalid, and asks him the question, he must have been thinking in his head something like, come on, man, the angels that stir the waters report to me. I created the water they stir. I created the dirt you're lying on. I created you. I created life itself. Do you want to get well? The second dimension of the question is, I think he's asking, do you have the desire to get well? See, first, it's like, do you know who I am? Do you understand who's, who's in front of you? But then he's cutting it to the, to the quick with the second part of the question. Do you have the desire to get well? Sometimes we can get so tired of trying to change something or trying to be something that we just give up trying. Usually, we don't even know that we've given up, but we either start becoming cynical or accepting the condition that we have, or maybe a mixture of both. We're a little bit cynical and a little bit just kind of accepting this is the way we're always going to be. I know I felt that way for a long time about a physical condition I had with chronic migraines. For years and years, I had these crippling daily migraines. Sometimes the migraines would last as much as a month at a time. They call it a migraine lock. I mean, it was so disabling. I mean, it just, you know, made me lie in my bed in pain for so many days on end. And I'd seen so many neurologists and tried so many gimmicks and people give me so many cures that I just kind of started getting cynical and accepting. This is just the way I am and nothing's ever going to cure me. So I understand what it's like to be trying to get something fixed and then just not be able to. And you just kind of accept that's just the way it's going to be. But the same thing can happen in areas of our life that are much more damaging than our health. If we're really honest with ourselves, we're not that unlike the guy in this story. See, there's areas in each of our lives that we are in that are. See, there's areas in each of our lives that are invalid. They're wrong and shouldn't be accepted. And so we're rendered as invalids or disabled in those particular areas. What's that condition for you? What part of your life is invalid or disabled or crippled? See, just like this guy, we get stuck remaining in the same traps of Satan for days, weeks, months, years on end. And we just kind of accept that's just the way it's going to be. We get a little cynical. I'm never going to change. Sometimes we're sinful invalids. Maybe you have a chemical addition, addiction like prescription drug abuse or addiction to nicotine, alcohol, recreational drugs. We can have a chemical addiction or a behavioral addiction, pornography, immorality, impurity, deceit, overeating, overspending. We can be sinful invalids. Or we can be character invalids. 
We struggle with insecurity, arrogance, or we have an abrasive personality. We're impatient, selfish, shy, lazy, and we wish we could change, but we just can't change. Or maybe we're relational invalids. We've been wounded. We've gotten bitter, cynical, unfeeling, critical, defensive, hypersensitive, lonely, emotionally disconnected in our marriage or with our kids or with our friends. Or sometimes we're salvation invalids. Our conversion was invalid because we didn't follow Jesus' commands. We followed what our pastor said or what our tradition said or what our parents said or our gut said, but we didn't follow what Jesus said. So we went to church, we believe in Jesus, but we didn't fully repent and fully commit our lives to Jesus and get baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. So we're salvation invalids. If one of these things describes you, one or more, and, and who doesn't it describe in some way? You have a choice. You can stay that way for another 38 years, blaming your circumstances or blaming other people, or you can look to Jesus and get well. Jesus is standing in front of us today. He's standing in front of you today. And he's saying basically what he said to this guy. Do you know who I am? Do you know what I'm capable of? Do you know what power I hold? If you're a sinful invalid, Jesus is saying, listen, I faced and overcame every temptation you have. I never sinned. I did all that to empower you. I died to release you from the power of sin. I've given you the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of my church to help you overcome every sin that tempts you. Do you want to get well? And one of the things I love about being in the ministry is just watching people change like this. Sinful invalids just completely transforming into righteous men and women of God. One that really stands out to me was this young man we studied the Bible with when I lived in Bangkok many years ago, but I remember it like it was yesterday. He came from a really rough past. He was in a gang, and the gangs over there, when they fought, I mean, it was like serious fighting. He used to fight with a sword, and in one instance, he remembers swinging the sword and cutting this guy's leg off. It was like, it's kind of gross, okay? But it's like just dangling on a little bit, and then he's going around just fighting some other people. Well, then a while later, months later, he's at the bus stop and he sees that same guy. And the guy's like got, you know, crutches and, and he's got some kind of uh, false leg or something like that. But, but he's like limping terribly. And the guy didn't know that it was this young man that had done it. And so they would meet all the time. He'd see him every day at the, at the bus stop after that. And every day he's facing this guy that he handicapped, that he cut his leg off. Well, we studied the Bible and he confessed that. He confessed, oh my gosh, so many other terrible things, more like sordid, terrible stuff than anybody I've ever studied the Bible with. But he got to the point that he was like really ready to repent. He was really ready to surrender his life to Jesus. And he's like, man, I want to make Jesus Lord. I want to be baptized. And so he was baptized. I mean, he's baptized into Christ and all that sin was completely washed away. And then over the months and years ahead to come, I, I watched him just change year after year. Then going back to visit many years later, I see this guy married to a great Christian woman and he had three kids. I mean, he's like this dad. And I look at this faithful husband, this faithful Christian, this faithful father with three children, and I think of who he was and then who he became. And I think, wow, Jesus can make anyone well. If you're a sinful invalid, Jesus can change you. If you're a character invalid, Jesus is saying, listen, I'm flawless in character, and I now live inside of you, and you live in me. I will transform you with ever-increasing glory into my likeness. I put you in my body so people can be my hands and my feet to make this transformation real and lasting. Do you want to get well? 
man, I think about how I've been transformed in this area over the years. I think back to my early years in college. I mean, I was an atheist. I had a military upbringing. I was in the military and ROTC at the time. I was in this karate gang that used to go down to New Orleans and get in fights and beat people up and stuff like that. I was an engineer, okay, not known for deep feelings and so forth. And all those things just made me into this, this arrogant, violent, unfeeling, impure person. And I look now, after becoming a Christian back in 1983, at that time, I look now, man, I'm a pastor. I'm a faithful husband of 35 years. There is no way I could experience that kind of transformation. If Jesus had asked me that question way back then, do you want to get well? If you're a relational invalid, Jesus is saying, listen, I created you to be connected to others. I know love. I am love. I give love. I show love. I can heal your marriage. I can bond you with your kids. I can bond you with your friends. I also put you in my church to find the relational strength you need to overcome. Do you want to get well? If you're a salvation invalid, Jesus is saying, listen, I came into the world to save souls. I gave up my life to save souls. This is my greatest passion and purpose. I came to you full of grace and full of truth. If you trust my truth, you'll find my grace. Make every effort to enter the kingdom, and I'll open wide my heart to save your soul. I've connected you with my children to help you find me and find salvation in me. Do you want to get well? Don't you love it when you see somebody get baptized like that? When you see somebody go, yes, I want to get well. I want to become a Christian. In the last uh, week here in Des Moines, we've had a couple people baptized. It's been really inspiring. But this one that kind of kicked it off a week ago is this girl's name is Marie Simon. And I'm going to show you a, a clip here in a second. But Marie grew up as best friends since she was three years old with Sarah Swinton. Sarah has been a disciple for many years, and Sarah reached out to her time and time again, but Marie was just not really open. But then God started working in her heart. They started studying the Bible just all since the pandemic started, and they got to the point that Marie was really ready to make Jesus Lord and get baptized, so we went out to this lake nearby, and she was baptized. Let's watch that video. Man, I love seeing that. I love seeing people make good on the promise and the plan of Jesus. Let's all get really practical for a minute here and ask and talk about how to find this power through Jesus. See, it's one thing to say, oh, Jesus can heal you. But you go, okay, well, how? How can he really change my life? If you really want to get well, do these three things. Okay, I'm going to break it down into three practical steps. Do these three things over and over and over, and you will get well. First, invoke the name of Jesus invoke the name of Jesus. Do you ever think of the power that's in the name of Jesus? See, a lot of times we just say Jesus or Jesus Christ or something, and we just kind of let it roll off our tongue, and we don't really realize what we're saying. Often when we pray, we say, I pray in Jesus' name, but we just kind of say it like a comma or like a, a period or something. I pray this in Jesus' name. Just kind of a, a traditional thing we say. But when you read in the Bible about the power of that name, it's pretty amazing. See, the Bible talks about how we're baptized in the name of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. Healings were done in the name of Jesus. We, we have life by believing in his name. The Bible says we have salvation when we call on his name. It says we are washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of Jesus. Paul calls his name the name that is above every name. I like that. The name that is above every name. The Bible says we have life in his name. 
Jesus talks about the church being those who are gathered in my name. And the Bible also says, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Wow. There's power in the name of Jesus. I love that song, the Revelation song. Do you know that song, the, the Revelation song? It says, has this line, it says, filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath, of li breath and living water. Such a marvelous mystery. And I love those lyrics, okay? I get shivery just thinking about that. Every time I hear that song, man, it just makes me shiver. It makes me tear up. I love that line. The power of your name, the mention of your name. There's power in the name of Jesus. I remember seeing this kind of in a fun way. When we were at Cal Berkeley, we were leading the campus ministry there many years ago. Barry and this, uh, this one of our Bible talk leaders named Dorrance were studying the Bible with someone and they went into a coffee shop, and there's a lot of coffee shops there in Berkeley, but they were known for being really packed, and it was hard to get a table. And so Dorrance and, and Barry were looking for a table to study the Bible, and Dorrance goes, oh, watch, this works every time. She goes and stands right in the middle of the crowd of, of tables and crowd of people, and she goes, Jesus, real loud. And right then this table just gets up and the people leave. Okay, I know it, it was like they, they didn't want to sit next to people talking about Jesus, but it worked nonetheless. There's power in the name of Jesus. When you pray in Jesus' name, when you invoke the name of Jesus, let me tell you, there is real supernatural power at work. So invoke the name of Jesus. Number two, invest in the plan of Jesus. The Bible describes how to have life in him. If you hold to his teaching, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The more you invest in the plan of Jesus, following him, being his disciple, obeying his word, the more he's able to work in your life and set you free. Are you invested in the plan of Jesus? See, if you're drifting, if you're holding back, if you're on the edge, kind of a little in, little out, little in, little out, you're not really all in, then man, you're losing power day by day. But when you go all in and invest everything you've got in the plan of Jesus, man, his power really starts working in your life. So invoke the name of Jesus. Invest in the plan of Jesus. And third and finally, invite the people of Jesus into your life. Jesus created his body to surround you, to protect you, to support you, to help you to transform you. You can't make it as an island. You can't be an island. We need each other. Are you learning from others? Confessing to others? Getting help from others? Getting encouragement from others? Challenge from others? Are you really getting discipling from other strong Christians? See, I know in any church, it's here in Des Moines and there in Minneapolis as well, some of you have to be constantly chased down by other disciples. Hey, you coming to church? Hey, you're going to make this meeting? Hey, where were you? Hey, I missed you. And that's just not going to work over the long haul. You'll eventually stagnate and die if you drift from the people of Jesus. You need to take the initiative. It's for your own good. It's, do you want to get well? If you want to get well, you got to take the initiative if you really want to become a strong disciple of Jesus. So invoke the name of Jesus. Invest in the plan of Jesus. Invite the people of Jesus into your life, and you'll be an invalid no longer. You will get well. Brothers and sisters, let's all face Jesus this morning and by his power, get up and truly get well. God bless you.